Alrighty, we are here with Andy Hunter, the founder and CEO of Bookshop.org, a company doing really, 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 really cool things. I'm going to set a record for really already uh, <laughs> for local bookshops and beyond. Andy, thank you so much for joining. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Thanks. Of course, of course. And uh, we're going to get into the world of bookshops, but more specifically with books. Uh, I just want to start off, you know, coming out hot right away. I heard a quote from you where you said that books saved your life. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, for sure. Um, You know, I was always a reader growing up, but I also had a kind of a rough childhood at a certain point. Um, my mom became extremely mentally ill and my dad um, left and moved across the country. And so it was me and my brothers living with a mentally ill mom that we basically had to care for. And at the time I was like 11 years old. Um, even before that, it hadn't been perfect, you know. And so I was like extremely socially awkward. Um, you know, I didn't have decent clothes. I didn't have great hygiene. Um, I hate to say it, but I wasn't a big fan of showers and there was nobody there to tell me to take one, you know? And so I couldn't really connect with my peers very well. You know, I was bullied and, and kind of an outcast. And what I found in books during that time period, um, which lasted to my teens, was, you know, soulless company and also a real greater understanding of myself and my place in the world, what was possible, you know, and it gave me hope and it built my empathy and understanding and and really just kind of kept me alive and kept me wanting to get up in the morning and kept me excited about what life could be. Um, and so when I say the books saved my life, I really do mean it. Like there was a time for at least five or six years in my childhood where without books, I don't know what I would have done. Um, And in some ways, books taught me how to get out of it too. Like they taught me how to cope and they still do. Like even after that, um, books broaden my perspective all the time and they help me understand humanity and my place in humanity and like what I want to do and why I want to do it. And um, like, they give you wisdom and also just they make like a lot life a lot more interesting you know and i think that they're they're good for human society like i think that if you look at the pr- printing press and you look at what happened like pre books versus post books like books have been inter- instrumental in in just kind of pushing human evolution forward yeah i'm right there with you and I appreciate you sharing all that um it, you know, it's, it's it's never fun when you're in a situation growing up where you have, you know, you 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 you're going through those emotions and, and in a tough environment where, you know, you feel like there's no hope there, and um, it's it's really uplifting that books became such a an influential part of your life, and I'm sure there's no way back then you would have seen and you know flash forward and be like, I'm gonna start a company and website that helps out lots of you know bookshops around the U.S. and world, but. Um, I think there is something so powerful about just sitting down with a really, really good book. To this day, what is it like? What is it about discovering a new book, having it in your hands, that just kind of leaves an impact on you? Well, I think it's like the closest thing that we have to, I don't know, like telepathy. you can immerse yourself in the mind of another person. You can immerse yourself in a world that is completely fabricated or in a world that is just hundreds of years ago in history. Like if you read Flaubert or Balzac, you can go back um, hundreds of years and learn so much about what people were like and all that. And Or if you're interested in like relativity. I mean, I learned so much from reading the physicist Brian, Brian Greene's books, and I learned so much about neuroscience by reading um, books like The Brain That Changes Itself. Like 
every everything because if you list like if, if you're just reading a short thing on the internet or if you just watch a YouTube video or whatever you can't get the kind of sustained logical building upon one piece building upon another building upon another and it's all happening completely in your mind so like you're shaping it too you're creating it and the fact that you're creating it based on these like tiny little symbols on piece on a piece of paper is like completely insane that you can that we have this way to to transfer thought personality and knowledge across time across different people's minds is truly extraordinary and there's nothing like it anywhere else so we started talking about books and we're already on to telepathy <laughs> so i appreciate the ingenuity there let's get to bookshop.org so obviously from an early age you found a home really in books and you found a passion for books maybe telepathy as well that's a story for another episode <laughs> but what was the turning point for you when you first thought that hey i could start some sort of a business or mission or like something out there to support local bookstores yeah it happened really gradually i mean going back to when i was a kid i wanted to own a bookstore like my dream life was to have a, a dog and a bookstore and sleep in the back room like that's what, all i wanted to do um my my ambitions expanded since then i got I had done work like in IT, I had done business systems, I learned accounting, I learned how to write software. I was also interested in writing. I got an MFA in creative writing. I um, was interested in editorial. I became editor chief of a magazine and then I started working in books. I eventually was an independent book publisher. So I had done all of these different things. And when I was in, and I was really interested in books, um, and when I started working in the book world around 2009, I started watching as Amazon was growing and growing and growing. And in the beginning, um, you know, it was 5%, then it was 15% on the market. And like, this is going to be something really powerful. And there needs to, I, I had thought at the time, there needs to be something independent um, that counteracts its weight that actually like has more of the values of, of the book community at heart. So I tried in 2011 to get a bunch of charitable foundations to create like a non-profit alternative book ecosystem because at the time I think Amazon had just bought Goodreads and between Amazon and Goodreads, I'm like, these guys are gonna like control everything around books if we don't watch out. Nobody was interested in 2011, nobody was worried, nobody cared, like that idea completely died. And then um, eight years later, Amazon had been growing six to eight percent year over year e-commerce was growing like 15 percent year over year amazon had over 50 percent of the book market it was 2019 and at that point like okay nobody has done this and nobody's going to do it so i'll try to do it and i put together a plan and started the long and difficult road of like fundraising and building alliances and trying to get people to to back it which was not easy if you tell people that your business is competing directly with Amazon. Most people are like, oh yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's something that I imagine most people wonder about when they first hear about your business is like, oh my God, like the, these people are going right at the, uh, as you've said before, at the Death Star <laughs> at Amazon. <laughs> so what, what were some of those reactions from uh, potential investors when you said that, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're going to go at this company that's taking over the world. Well, honestly, um, all, it was almost all no's. It was like the loneliest and, and most isolating, um, time that I've had in my professional career because I would just go to meeting after meeting and I'm probably not that good at pitching, but so maybe that's part of it, but it's also part of it is that even if it succeeds, its purpose is to help strengthen independent bookstores. So it's not a 10x or 100x scenario. Like if, we, if we're hugely successful and have tons of profits, those profits are supposed to go to support local businesses, not support the investors. So that was tricky. But the real tricky part was that people were just like, the American consumer only cares about speed and price. And if you can't beat Amazon on speed, you can't beat them on price, then you're dead in the water. And I had 
um, several investors bow out for basically that kind of rationale. In the end, I was able to convince some people in book publishing that it was worth taking a flyer and then a few kind of high net worth individuals who loved books, had either written books or were, deep, were deeply connected. And uh, I raised about half of the money I wanted to raise. I only wanted to raise 1.2 million and I only raised 700,000 and, um, and $700,000 to try to create an e-commerce marketplace that beats Amazon at selling books is not a lot of money. But eventually I was like, we, got, we just want to build this thing. So even though I don't have as much raise as I want, and we're not going to have the runway I wanted. We're just going to start start building. Yeah, I mean, 700K is nothing to scoff at. But when you're considered the uh, rather large competitor <laughs> in the space, among other competitors, I, I could see how it feels pretty dwarfed by that. So how, you know, you have the strong mission there. Like, you have that passion of wanting to support local bookstores. How did you start to put the pieces together of like what this would actually look like to the point of like, okay, people are people are going through us to find books and find bookstores, but like how do we make sure everybody gets, you know, their share and that this mission comes to life? Yeah, well, you'd kind of bring the stakeholders on board from the beginning. That was kind of my plan for both, like how we actually make an impact in these people's businesses, but also how we grow, because we didn't have money to spend on big direct consumer marketing campaigns and buy Facebook ads and Google ads and that kind of thing. So we needed all everybody to be behind it. So we went to conferences, we went to individual bookstores, we tried to get influential booksellers on our board of directors. Um, we had to prove to them that we had their interest at heart. We put in our bylaws that we weren't going to sell to Amazon. And so it's in our shareholder agreement. So even if Amazon tries to buy us out, it can't happen. And once we had the booksellers on board, we expanded to other kind of um, types of affiliates and groups like literary magazines, nonprofits, um, librarians, like everybody that's in the book world. We wanted them to have pages on Bookshop. And the way Bookshop works is like, it's it's sort of like social e-commerce like all any individual or organization can create their own page and curate books and promote books and receive a portion of the, of the money from their sale so um it was really building the all that network and that's what really helped us launch because instead of just having us saying hey pay attention to us we're trying to do this thing we, we launched with over 250 partners that were all on bookshop and they were all promoting their pages too What were those early days like of, you know, starting to see the, I, I, I guess, I don't know if you consider it revenue or contributions, but like the money, the money raised towards the local bookstores, like how, what did that look like in the early days and, and like how long did it take till it felt like it really started to pick up? Yeah, well, luckily, like our trough of despair or whatever they call that, like if you see that that's a popular like startup graph that shows like you launch and you're excited, and then then it sinks and you go through yeah, this trough of despair. Usually very short lived and a very long trough. <laughs> yeah. So we our trough of despair was not very long. Um, we did sort of have one. I mean, we launched. I didn't have huge expectations because I was going with the launch with an MVP. If you're not embarrassed by what you launch with, you launch too late kind of idea. So when we launched, we didn't have shipping notifications even. We, there was so much that we still needed to build. Um, and then, you know, we had some people who were skeptical. We, we made the decision to put the amount of money that we had earned for bookstores on our homepage and in a top banner across all the pages of our site. So I was inspired by places like GoFundMe because I think that that's motivating and it's amazing to see that your purchase makes a contribution. You actually made a difference when you buy something and I think that's great positive feedback. But it also meant that anybody who wanted to check exactly how we were doing could come and see exactly how many books we sold and exactly how much money we had earned. And in the beginning, those numbers were not very big. So we did have some people on podcasts saying like, oh, this isn't working out. Like after a month after we launched, it's like, give us yeah, more yeah, than so, a so, month. Sorry about that. I just couldn't wait to, uh, you know, trash your company. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then two weeks after that, um, 
COVID hit. And once COVID hit, all these bookstores had to literally go on lockdown. They couldn't even have their employees come in to fill in online orders because they couldn't put their employees at risk. Everybody was sheltering in, at home and they, didn't, they couldn't do curbside pickup in the beginning. All, the only way they could sell books is by selling online. And we went from having 250 stores to having 1,200 stores. And we went from selling $50,000 worth of books in February of 2020 to selling $150,000 worth of books a day in, by May. Um, in July, we sold $12 million worth of books. We, had, we In February, we had four employees, including me, and I had a day job. And by July, we were doing $12 million in a month and fulfilling thousands and thousands of orders. And it was, it was the craziest experience um, of growth, like speaking of max growth, that was a lot of growth very fast. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that is, a, you know, as if there wasn't enough going on in the world. Um, that's a wild ride and, and, and change of, uh, I guess, change of scenery there and change of how podcasters can talk about your company in the early days there. <laughs> but that's, that's just an incredible growth. There was actually a guy that how, said he was going to eat his shoe if it succeeded. And I haven't seen him um, to I, actually I, ask him to eat his shoe. I let, I let it go. Let's hope there's no footage of that. <laughs> you, you, from, from day one, did you set it up as a, a B Corp? Yeah, well, I mean, it, you, you have to go through a rigorous um, audit to become a B Corp. So we set up as a benefit corporation, which is basically saying the purpose of this company is for the social for social good. And then we went through B Labs, which is the, com- the company or organization that vets B Corps. We started their process of validating um, that we were ethical, that we had... Um, good internal practices that we were making a positive impact on the world, that we had a low environmental footprint and all of that. And that took about a year and a half. Um, but not only did we get certified, but we got certified as one of the best in, for the world B Corps, which meant we scored in the top 5% of all B Corps nationwide. So we were super proud of that. Wow. Yeah, and you should be. And congrats on that. And it's so funny that a company whose mission is to support local bookstores is being questioned on its ethics. <laughs> you think that would be a no a no brainer? <laughs> well, you know, there were the industry has been burned before, and and honestly, like a lot of, I think I don't think it, I don't think it's unreasonable for someone to be skeptical. There's a lot of brands trying to sell that they're socially conscious or um, eco friendly, where if you peel back a few layers, it's more of a marketing gimmick. And for bookstores, they had seen, like, uh, most people don't know this, but Borders Books, which used to be this huge chain, made an agreement that Amazon was going to do all their online ordering fulfillment. And and Amazon was like, oh, yeah, we understand the Internet. We're going to help you sell books on the Internet. And then, like, five years later, Amazon had driven Borders completely out of business. So independent bookstores had seen things like that happen before. And they're like, is this going to be a rug pull? Like, you... And I think that they're they're right to be wary. Like restaurants have seen rug pulls, like sites like Grubhub that used to be very very good for for restaurants, now are like at best a love hate relationship because the costs once you have full buy in then the costs go up. Um, the reason that we've got booksellers on our board of directors and the reason that we are B Corp and all that is because we we really want to make sure that that never happens. That we're always fulfilling our mission that border story hits close to home i think uh you know growing up in my hometown our our like bigger bookstore i guess was borders and i had never thought about it too much but looking back like it was like pretty popular and then it just seemed like it closed overnight one time and 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 that was it and i, I think you revealed you know what was going on there in the greater uh business and amazon world but um it's uh, for it, it it's can be such a cutthroat industry when you have competitors like that uh, even though it is something that is like all focused on books which is such a positive and like optimistic and stress relieving thing like it's a, it's a really interesting industry dynamic there what has been 
the biggest drivers and you know like so you so you had that we'll call it you know you were talking about the trough of despair then you had the like the opposite you had like the hot streak <laughs> in 2020 yeah. and you know where your, your your monthly revenue is now what you're doing in like you know from breakfast to lunch um what has been the biggest driver in growing that to the level now where like you have i think recently at the time of this recording passed the mark of 30 million dollars um for that you, that you've created and and raised and given back to local book, bookstores so congrats on that like that's an incredible milestone what, what do you think has driven the continued growth of this and and supporting your mission that way thank you yeah like it, it's really omni-channel um where there's not one thing. I mean, obviously, COVID kickstarted everything, but since we've become a more mature business, it's more like you can look at the different revenue streams. First of all, we've made a real effort to become linked on all, in all different major publications. So it used to be that Amazon's affiliate program was like the only game in town, and they would pay four and a half percent off of any book sale. So we created an affiliate program where we were like, okay, if you link to us, we're going to pay you 10% and we give a matching 10% to independent bookstores. So you're, you're, hoping, you're helping your local businesses and you're helping your publication at the same time. And then we got those links everywhere. So now, by now, we have links on like Time Magazine, BuzzFeed, NPR, like The Atlantic, all of these great trusted media brands are linking to us with book when they cover books. Sometimes they only link to us, sometimes they link to us and Amazon, but they link to us. So that's that's a big driver. We we have now 1900 stores, bookstores on our platform in the US and 500 in the UK. That made that's like 80% of the the American Bookseller Association members are on our platform. And so those stores are bringing customers to us every day too. And we still rely on a ton of of word of mouth because about 80% of our profit margin goes to the stores. We still don't have a lot of money for digital advertising. We spend about 1% of our annual revenue on digital ads. Um, And most e-commerce companies, that's closer to 5 to 10%. So so we're still like big word of mouth, community building, um, trying to get authentic people to believe in what we're doing and, and be loyal to us because they're they're happy about their impact and, and impact is a a very relevant and accurate word um you know those are those are wonderful things that you're doing and it's awesome when you see people come together and and i think that you, you have a mission that people just can latch onto and really get behind on that note what have you heard what kind of feedback have you heard from local bookstore owners about the company and, and community and possibilities that you've created with bookshop.org. If I could pronounce your URL correctly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'd say 95% of the booksellers are very grateful. Um, there are many, many stores that actively try to grow sales using bookshop. And then there are also just as many that don't do anything, but just get checks from us. Um, a lot of them are resource constrained, you know, and, I think the most important thing for us is to change their mindset about online because if you look at online as a threat and you don't have a presence there, you don't have time, you don't understand how it works and you just think of it as a place where it's competing for your customers um, and is a danger, then you're never going to be able to like succeed in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, e-commerce is growing 15% year over year. More and more people are shopping online. Even local businesses have to have an online strategy. So for us, getting the stores on board with that and telling them, like, we're going to make a lot it a lot simpler for you. We're going to do everything we can to make it easy. So even though you have no resources and, you know, you're not trained in this stuff, we're going to be able to create online sales as an important part of your profitability every year. So th- that has been great. And, you know, I'm about to go to a bookseller conference um, next week and we're going to have a huge round table about how people are using it successfully. At the same time, there's a lot more we can do. We have about, you know, a little over 1% of the um, book market right now. Amazon has over 
50%. They're probably about 60%. So we need to get more than one out of 60 customers to say like, hey, I need to buy this book. I'm going to do it in a way that supports my local businesses and keeps like these businesses in our downtowns. You know, a lot of people who love books, love bookstores. And this is just about you know, closing that circle. Real quick on that, because I could talk about it, but it wouldn't be nearly as, as exciting coming from me. What does a bookstore mean to you? Like what sort of like, you know, the the vibes, like there's some sort of magic in bookstores, but I'd love to hear your perspective. Yeah, on I mean, they're like sanctuaries, but they're also like gates. I mean, I'm using fantastic language, but like that, that is fantastic. When, when I was a kid, let's get to tele- telepathy. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you know, I used to read a lot of fantasy. I don't when I'm now that I'm kind of older, I don't read a lot of like fantasy. But as a teenager, you I take that read back. a lot. Um, You're just wiser. I, I would, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I would anytime I went to a store. I mean, when I went to a new town or went on vacation somewhere, um, I would find a bookstore and I would just hunker down and read a ton, find new things. And then even as a teenager, like I was exposed to like the kind of counterculture that I was into. Like this was pre-internet, like, or the internet existed, but it wasn't what it is today. Um, and bookstores were just incredible portals of discovery for me. And, they, um, and also they're staffed by people who love books as much as I do. Like they're, that's what, bookshop is all about it is like countering the algorithm approach to books because human beings are what matter when it comes to books like and people who are inspired by books and decide to dedicate their lives to them like people who run book and own bookstores are like the salt of the earth and they're not doing it for money and there's not very much money in running a bookstore right but if you go to a bookstore you can meet people who who understand and are inspired by the power of books and they can transfer that power over to you and it's awesome um and no algorithm will will ever be able to do that and if you think about why you bought a book like you usually buy it because somebody you respect tells you that you should read it like whether it's a friend or a parent or oprah or whoever like you're buying a book because somebody says like oh you got to read this book it's a person yeah that would be a real tragedy if people who worked at bookstores hated books uh, that's, <laughs> that feels like an snl skit or something <laughs> there's just books everywhere <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful uh mission and um just just way you have of looking at books and bookstores and i yeah you, you were kind of tongue-in-cheek making fun of your language but using thinking of them as gates or portals i think is just an awesome way to think about it because it really unlocks something and sometimes you read a book that's just at the right time that you need to go on a mental vacation to somewhere around the world or out of this entire universe, a different universe. So you never know what it can turn into. I'd love to switch gears a little bit and dive more into you on the personal side. So you're, you're someone who has spent you know, a lifetime being interested in books, being interested in writing. But then this entrepreneurship thing comes along and it's it's a bit different to know what you know the word entrepreneur is and know what entrepreneurship is versus actually doing it yourself and so you've had some experience in kind of multiple stops of your career there but what was the adjustment like in going from you know having a job being being a writer of sorts to being like you know the the person like the business owner the entrepreneur trying to get something rolling yeah, well, I always like making things. So, you know, in college, I lived in a house that had an independent record label. And when I got out of college, I started my own little magazine. So I had this kind of entrepreneurial vibe, which was a really DIY, like do it yourself thing. And honestly, all of my opportunities came out out of these things that I built on my own. Um, like I wasn't asking for permission. I wasn't trying to get an internship at a big magazine and, and work my way up the ranks. I was like, I'm going to make my own magazine. And, and I think that is the entrepreneurial mindset. And it's 
it, it's extremely liberating and it's really exciting. There's nothing like the excitement of, especially when you're starting something, when you're pulling ideas together and inspiring other people and building something that didn't exist before and getting critical mass for it. It's like a great feeling. At the same time, it's like really nerve wracking and harrowing. And a lot of entrepreneurs like will talk about how incredibly stressful it is. You have to be ready to fail. Failure, you know, happens all the time and things go wrong all the time. It doesn't have like a support network and it's very experimental. And that is like, you really have to have sleepless nights and you have to be good at managing your stress and all that. And I'm pretty even keeled, but even then it's like been torture sometimes, but it's got highs and lows. And what are you going to do? Like, that's what life's all about. Like I'm, I'm much rather have highs and lows than be bored. I was a file clerk for a year at a law firm when I was 23 and I was bored stiff. I would never want to live like that again. I'm bored hearing you just describe that role. <laughs> it, it, torture is is an interesting, but I think accurate way of looking at it as well as an entrepreneur. It's like a, it's it's a torture of love. Like if you're starting, you know, if you're running a business, if you're building a business that you're passionate about, like you don't think of it as like, oh my god, I have to spend so many hours a week working on it. Like you just do it. Like it's you know, it's it's part of the gig, but also like. There are lots and lots of sleepless nights, I'm sure, as you know, of taking much longer to fall asleep than otherwise because you're thinking of so many different aspects of the business or like maybe you're working more on weekends than you would otherwise. Like there's a lot of sacrifices. There's a lot of torture there, as you said. How have you been able to reduce your stress levels as part of your entrepreneurial, as part of your entrepreneurial journey? Well, I'd say exercise like good ex exercise and like good sleep hygiene is really important and i think it's often neglected and it was neglected by me but back you know before i became good at it i would like end a stressful day with a couple of beers and then get six hours or five hours of sleep and then you know you're running ragged all the time like just having Better habits has been a game changer for me. Um, and I also think just bringing in people you trust, like people, I used to read advice that says like hiring is the most important thing you can do, uh, like and getting the right hires. And like, I kind of was like, yeah, that sounds right, whatever. But I didn't think much about it. But now that I've been through this a few times, like who you have at your side is everything and like understanding that you have people that you trust who are competent that you can share the load with um is huge so i'd say like good habits um a good support network and um you know trustworthy comrades in arms trying to do it with you uh, that's what i think is the most important oh, that's a great rundown how do you personally seek or, or or qualify talent like people that are gonna you know join join you join your mission there i mean i think you have to identify people who are really passionate about the same you know what you're passionate about who are like-minded but also who are ambitious um in in the startup world you can't just be like oh i i just want to decent life and work-life balance i want to clock out at five and um in the beginning you really got to go all in when you're a little bit more mature you've actually like hit product market fit you can start worrying about um balance and, and when you bring in new employees you can allow them to have that balance and all that but in the beginning you got to find some people who are ride or die and also you know who have diverse skill sets one of the most important things that you can do is hire people who are better than you at whatever they're supposed to be doing. A lot of entrepreneurs are generalists. I'm a generalist, so I'm pretty good at writing copy and I'm pretty good at advising people on like UI, UX design, and I'm pretty good at project management. I'm pretty good at Google Analytics. I'm pretty good at a lot of things. And in the beginning when I'm doing everything, it's enough. But ideally, I'm going to have people who are better at all those things once I grow and I've got like a staff of 40 people I shouldn't be doing all those things. And every person that I hire to do those things needs to be better than me at it. 
And I think for ego reasons, sometimes it's hard for people to, to get around, but it's really critical. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally with you. I think there's, it's, it's incredibly important to like know from the get-go that there's just like a good fit with the people that you're gonna work with because you're gonna spend so much time with them. And also like people, I think have to have a little bit of uh, you know wild and crazy in them and that entrepreneurial spirit, spirit, <laughs> spirit, in, in order to join a startup, um, especially in the early days like that. Um, so you, you, you attract a really, you know, passionate breed there as well. I'm also curious on, you know, because we keep going back to like so much of your company goes back to its mission and everything with like the B Corp and a, you, you being even so transparent, transparent on your website about like how much money, you know, you raise for local bookstores. What advice would you have for any aspiring entrepreneur out there who wants to start a business around some sort of cause or mission that they're really passionate about and they want to be, you know, like transparent with like, all right, we're going to, we're going to set aside this much amount of profit or revenue or revenue, even with the voice crack there, uh, to give back to, you know, X group, whatever. I think the most important thing is that you connect with the people you're trying to help, like whatever, you know, you need to, there needs to be a pain point. There needs to be something that's wrong that you're trying to fix and the fix is needed. People want what you have to offer and there's a real need for it. A lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of doing something that's kind of cool or sounds interesting, but nobody is like dying for it to happen. But so if you're sure that there's a need, then you talk to the people who have that need and you learn from them how you can best solve their problems and work with them. And that, first of all, is like invaluable market research that you can use to build a great product, but it's also aligning internal support in whatever industry or world that you're trying to enter into, whether you're working with healthcare workers or you're working, you know, with school teachers, it or you're working with like um, after school athletic programs. It doesn't matter what the vertical is. It's like you gotta talk to the people who've been doing it for 20 years. Um, they're gonna tell you a lot about what they need and whether your solution is gonna fit and also if you give them what they want, then they're going to be your biggest supporters and they're going to help you build a grassroots, um, enthusiastic user base that you can grow from. So I just think, yeah, doing that, identifying the key stakeholders and the people who have been in that world for a while, learning from them and then helping them, getting them on board and getting them on your side. All on your side. I'm totally on your side as well, Andy. I appreciate the advice there. Let's switch it up a bit more to a section I call the unusual. So pet peeves, quirks, weird talents. This goes beyond just like through the mindset of a business owner. This is just you personally. It's always fascinating to hear entrepreneurs of, you know, different aspects of their personality. And so first there, what is a, I call it a weird talent you have, like a party trick or just something, it doesn't have to do with your business at all, but just something you're really good at, but has no impact on your business. Wow. It's a really good question. I mean, well, thank you. If it really has no impact, because well, think, I know there's always a way to technically make it tie to the business, but I, yeah. Well, I, I think I think that my talent, if I have one talent, it's like figuring out how different things fit together that other people think are unrelated or wouldn't think to put together, um, and so that really helps with problem problem solving but it also helps when you like are conceiving of a business or trying to innovate because innovation a lot of people think it's like invention and it's coming out of nowhere so you have inspiration and you create something that never existed before but that's not really what it is what it is is putting existing things together together in a new way in a way that is slightly different um that is what innovation is all about nothing comes from out of nowhere everything is built upon a history of human effort and human knowledge and it's about how you combine the things um that is what is unique about it and that is what's going to bring it life and, and get it traction and and so like 
I understand this isn't like an unusual, it's not too far afield. I wish I could think of it like I'm, I think I use everything I'm good at in my business. Honestly, like I'm bad at a lot of stuff. Like I'm terrible at sports. Um, I, you know, I, I naturally would stay up late and like eat bad foods. Eat, I, I'll eat a pint of ice cream if you put it in front of me. Like I don't have great impulse control. Like I'm not good at a lot of things. Um, the things that I'm good at, I try to put into my business. Well, you're, <laughs> we could have a lot of fun going down the ice cream and late night sports rabbit hole, but, uh, well, I guess late night food rabbit hole, <laughs> not sports, but <laughs> I think your, your, your point on putting things together like that, that is a really hell of a skill to have as an entrepreneur. And I remember going back to, you know, study, studying business in college, like one of the things in an entrepreneurship course, one of the things they talked about was that like it is extremely hard, almost impossible to come up with just like a brand new, totally novel, pun intended, books, uh, idea. It's much more feasible to take existing ideas and then combine them or put, or put them in a new light and like add your spin on it. And it's, it's the same thing of how it works in the, in the music world. Like some of the biggest hits always that you hear on whatever you listen to uh, are remixed or sampled from you know previous hits or previous under the radar songs like same thing applies in the business world music and beyond so that's that's an awesome point there how about quirks what's something a little quirky about your personality that and there's no shame here um that maybe your family team somebody calls you out for but it's it's who you are you've always been that way there's no shame oh i don't know i think um i'm because I didn't grow up with any structure, I'm not like normally like Mr. Structure or Mr. Consistency. Like I'm more like, I'll have an idea, I'll do something differently. Um, and that is something that like I really think is great and it's helped me a lot, but also sometimes it throws people off because a lot of times in the day to day, people want consistency. Really being a parent has made me realize it because like with, when you have a kid and you're walking them home from school and they're like, can I have some M&Ms? And you're like, yeah, let's have some M&Ms. Like it sounds like super fun, right? We're going to be inconsistent. We're going to randomly get you some M&Ms on the walk home from school today. And then you so have fun for five minutes. Yeah. And then the next day it's time for M&Ms. And you're like, no, that was a special time. And then every day they're going to ask you for M&Ms. And, or, you know, when you have, when you are kind of random and inconsistent, it can throw people off and it can create problems. It can also be a great opportunity for wonderful moments of spontaneity and happiness. Um, so that's like learning how to be consistent when it's required um, has been a big effort for me um, as I get older and try to run a company. It's a lot different also running a company that's four years old than starting a company. And four years old still isn't old, but um, you need different skills. You have to become a little bit more like reliable and consistent. And you have to understand that if you have a crazy new idea, you can't just throw it out there because it'll destabilize people. If the boss comes and says, hey, we're going to do this new thing, People can sometimes be like, what? That's crazy. We don't know how to do that. And that's a lot sounds like a lot of work. And is that gonna work out? So you gotta be careful about throwing out your your ideas. Just in the same way you wouldn't sit down at your dinner table and be like, what if we move to Minnesota? Like it's gonna throw your family off, even if you just think it's fun to think about. So like <laughs> learning how to let ideas like mature and not throw people off and use your spontaneity carefully and provide people with the consistency that they need and structure that they need has been a big, a big period of growth for me. Uh, right now, our audience in Minnesota is, you know, pounding their fists <laughs> at you, but <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I love that there. And then pet peeves. What is something that is in the grand scheme of life, very minuscule which i can never pronounce right uh very like no big impact at all maybe it's something around the house or just in everyday life but it just grinds your gears a little bit recently i've been driven crazy by the way that people stand in the doorway of the subway in new york city 
there will be this huge empty subway car and then there will at least be like two people with backpacks on that just walk one step into the car and then stay there and you can't get on or off the subway because they're just standing there it that drives me crazy and i think in general everything that kind of is like where somebody chooses to not honor the social contract because they're like lazy or obstinate like all that kind of stuff bothers me um because i live in new york city it's it, a lot of my pet peeves are urban like i wish people didn't honk their horns so freaking much i wish oh my god i, I was literally uh, I, I just interviewed uh, an entrepreneur his name's bryce out of north dakota and we talked about horn honking and i'm like he like he he said in north dakota everyone's so nice and friendly there that no one honks their horn ever and i'm like in the New York area, I said, like, I want to ban horns, like, except for emergency situations yeah. is the most annoying thing. That, that's, that would be my legislation that would make me deeply unpopular if I became president or whatever. Well, spe especially like, in Minnesota. You wouldn't get the Minnesota vote. I think everybody should be allowed to use their horn like five times a month. And then after that, there should be like a $20 charge. <laughs> that's awesome. The horn, the horn fee. Well... Mr. Structure, Mr. Consistency, let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q&A. You ready for it? Sure. All right, let's get wild. Don't get too excited there. Uh, <laughs> what, I know you study creative writing. What is the top or what was the most fun creative writing exercise that came to that comes to mind? Oh, I God, I guess um the, the most fun I've ever had writing was was to write like a long personal ad. Um, I don't really, I'm not like Mr. Prompt or, or creative writing exercises. I am trying to write a book, but, um, but yeah, writing a personal ad in a fictional voice, that was fun. And it allows you to, you know, you can layer a lot of things in there. And I like writing things that are funny. So there's a lot of room for making jokes in fake personal ads. Well, I already called you Mr. Structure and Mr. Consistency. Now you're making me throw Mr. Prompt in there as well. So this <laughs> is like, yeah, I don't know, Mr. And Mrs. Smith here. I don't you know. You prompted but, me. I think you're Mr. Prompt. <laughs> Appreciate it, Mr. Prompt. Oh, boy, that's a, quite the nickname. Uh, what I, I know also earlier in your career you worked on Lollapalooza magazine. So really, really cool stuff with Lollapalooza. Uh, just to confirm, is that tied to the concert or was that totally separate? Oh, yeah. That was um, a, a tour publication. I worked with Perry Farrell, who created um, the yeah. Lollapalooza tour. I used Jane's to work addiction. out of yeah. his house. Yeah. Um, oh, no way. Which he lived in this uh, converted airplane hangar, and he had a, a <laughs> koi pond and a stream running through its entire length. So it was like a basically a babbling brook and a koi pond in his house. Um, it was really cool. And working with him was great. What was your, what's the most memorable moment or quick story you have from working with him? Well, <laughs> I don't know if I can talk about them. I mean, I was <laughs> like, I was friends with a lot of musicians. What I loved about that, like in LA in my twenties, was I was just really allowed to like interact with all of these legendary people um and so meeting um and hanging out with people who like had inspired me when I was a teenager listening to their records um those were the greatest moments and that's really why, why I was interested in that job um but things would get pretty pretty wild in that world I think that probably everybody is is like sober now but back in the day things were pretty crazy I was fortunate to see Jane's addiction at uh, gravity games in Cleveland back in the early 2000s which was like the you know like the bizarro x games and it just blew my mind and still I love Jane's addiction to this day and everything there is um I mean, Lala obviously now in Chicago has like taken on a, a life of its own, but um, that's really really cool. You got to step into that world there. I'm sure. Yeah, we can talk for hours and hours, maybe offline about <laughs> more stories from that. But all right, 
what is the just most intriguing book cover that you've ever seen? I know you can't pick your favorite children, but just in tart, you know, they say you can't judge a book by its cover, but what, what's a cover that you think is really clever and creative? God, I, I needed that question in advance. I would need, <laughs> um, I they, they don't that, call me Mr. Prompt for nothing. Yeah. Um, I think McSweeney's, um, which is a magazine and the press, um, coming out of San Francisco generally are the most innovative in their designs and they do all kinds of like super interesting stuff with their covers um and so while i can't like specify a certain one i think generally like their packaging um and the way that they present their books is is probably the most exciting out there and then last one what is the most mouth-watering delicious bingeable ice cream flavor that you have ever tasted Oh, wow, that's a good question. That's something that me and my 12-year-old daughter are on a constant quest to discover. That's um, a fun research project. <laughs> yeah, Family yeah. Project. I mean, right now I'm liking Van Llewellyn, which is a local New York brand. Um, I think it's getting more and more popular. I am a, currently, I guess I'm a fan of their honeycomb. From my childhood, I love malted vanilla, which is almost impossible to find as an ice cream, but I used to get malted vanilla milkshakes when I was a kid, and I loved them. Like that and the grilled cheese was like my favorite thing. And so since then, I've always been on the quest for like the best malted vanilla ice cream or milkshakes, and they're kind of rare. Um, and I think Tillamook is the only ice cream manufacturer that still makes malted vanilla that you can buy in stores, but I can't find it in New York. Ooh, that's that's a wonderful throwback. Yeah, I think to growing up, my dad, like his one of his guilty pleasures was, you know, if you go to like a diner or like, you know, steak and shake type style place, Johnny Rockets like that, was to get like a, a giant malt. And yeah. I didn't know what it was at first. And then I tasted it. I was like, that's pretty damn good. I see why you like this. <laughs> They're the best. Well, the 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 anti Mr. Prompt. No, I'm just kidding. Andy, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. Just love everything you're doing and so inspiring to to see and hear your growth story. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh obviously bookshop.org. It's pretty, you know, intuitive how to find bookshop.org. But uh is there a place that if people wanted to connect with you online or just anything else you want to shout out? Yeah, well I mean I'm on LinkedIn. Um uh, my email is andy at bookshop.org. So just, yeah, people can feel free to reach out to me. I love hearing from people. I love collaborating. Perfect. And then, uh, you know, maybe if you're lucky, Andy, someone will send you a, uh, the best malt in the world. I don't even know where to find it. Maybe we'll head up Tillamook, but no, but last thing, final thoughts. It could be just a quote, words to live by, whatever you want. Send us home here. Yeah. Um, I think, I guess the words to live by is like, be aware, like be conscious. So much of people's day-to-day lives, they're not really, they're like in a half slumber. I think it's really important to kind of wake up almost as if you had amnesia and you're like, where am I? What, what am I doing here? Like it's really important to go through an exercise like that at least once a month just and be like, like, what am I feeling? Like, what's my environment? Like, really be there. It's kind of like mindfulness, but not just mindfulness, because it's also like putting your life in perspective and making sure that you're like doing the right things, breaking out of the day to day and like trying to view things from a little bit of perspective. So if you've got like that point of view camera, just taking the point of view camera and making it a little bit above you so you can see yourself in your perspective and figure out like, what am I doing here? Um, that's, that's my words, words of wisdom is to do that regularly. Bring on the bongos. <laughs>